Would you please join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Amen.
to be reconciled first. How many of us do that? I imagine if we had a, a clear, invisible wall between here and that baptismal font, and as we're coming forward to receive, and we have not reconciled, it's like God is almost in a way, we hit that and we fall back and say, oh wait, yes, I do need to reconcile before I take the sacrament. And yet, there is another view that the sacrament is so powerful and mysterious and full of God and healing and grace and love that we need that nourishment to then go do the hard work of reconciliation. To look inwardly. To go from this body language to this. To move from a place of pride to a place of humility. To move from a place of I'm right and you're wrong, either or thinking. And even me, I mean, I don't do it and I'm guilty of it too. I, I have relationships that I'm not reconciled to and so should I do the sacrament as a priest? I'm human too. But we have a choice, life or death. We are involved in this cosmic mystery. We just don't sit quietly and allow it to happen to us. We have to partake. And I want to tell you about a story that has been really wrenching at me for the last couple of days, a very gut-wrenching story, true story. And it involves someone who's dying, and um, is in hospice, and the sister of this person is coming forward at the point of death, as, as many family members would and expect that. And then there's another family member, although not really officially, but almost. And they're both at odds, these two women, at great odds with each other, about the death of this man. And there's fighting and quarreling and hatred and jealousy. And so when I was at the hospital yesterday, and I kind of got roped into this discussion, the nurses had to call the doctor to come because, you know, the doctor has some more authority uh, in saying, you know, you've got to stop this. He knows what's happening. He's dying. And I had to, in a way, I didn't want to tell her to read 1 Corinthians 3, that wouldn't have been appropriate, about her spiritual infantile behavior, about her pride. What I did have to say is, as you have told me, sister, he is going to die. And the final days that he has, do not need to be filled with angst and hatred. So whether you go in the room one hour and the other person goes in the next hour or the next day and how it all worked it out, something has to be done. Because this is a holy moment. try very carefully to pick my words because it's a very, very emotional time for this family. And every word that I chose was parsed out carefully in my body language and praying, trying to get through her to her, trying to let God work through me to get to her heart. And her answer was, I cannot do that. I just can't do it. I cannot and I will not. And 
And I felt a great sadness. And I still feel that. And so what's going to happen unless God performs a miracle? And I'm always hoping there's a miracle because we always have hope in our God. Always. Is that he will intervene and do something. So that this, this nonsense that we get caught up in as people, you and me, and whatever our nonsense is, to realize that God is at the heart of things if we would allow ourselves to take down our pride and our anger and allow Him to move through us with deep humility and openness. And so I said I'd call today and, and I'm going to go by and visit the hospital after the play this afternoon before I have a dinner tonight in Dallas. And I hope and pray that some that God will intervene in the last 24 hours. What do you choose? Life or death? What do you choose today? What about tomorrow? What about with your own sister, your child? 